we were bombing uh, I think it was Was it now? You, a lot of your missions are in Germany and Austria. Yeah, this so was. I think this was, was Austria. One of the oil dumps or ball bearing factories or one of right. those places. That kind of thing. And a lot of uh, anti aircraft. And we're on our way back. Uh, and what we always. Uh, looked for is the route to go back to the Adriatic and the Adriatic would we'd fly back to our base and uh, it was a, a 97 base and uh, what occurred was uh, I get a call from the tail gunner telling me that number two engine is on fire and the fire is coming over the tail, the elevator, and uh, so that he didn't have to say much more than that. And uh, left the formation, shut the engine down, fed it a prop, and uh, and I flew uh, very close to the Alps, and uh, and very slowly, the engines off, the prop is uh, is feathered, and uh, um, uh, the fire is going out. And as I look up at the uh, the Alps, there above me mm -hmm. is Tuskegee, and I had two planes, one above me and one below me, and uh, they followed me very, very slowly until I got back to uh, the Adriatic and uh, and then back to the, the base on three engines, which is really not a, not a difficult thing. Uh, but save the airplane yeah. and, and yourselves. Well, there's ten, ten right. guys. And so you plane. had two red tails uh, escorted you all two. the way. Not all the way. They took us into the uh, Adriatic, mm -hmm. and once we were uh, down, uh, it was a, a good, a good, probably about three hundred miles or so to get back to the base. But their base was much further north, mm -hmm. the Tuskegee guys, and of course uh, they couldn't go all the way with me. Uh, they got gas problems and stuff like that. But, but uh, they were there when you needed them. Well, once you got over the ocean, you were home safe. Uh, Pretty that. much. What uh, what base in England were you flying out of? Not England. Italy. Oh, you're flying out of Italy. Italy. Okay. And what base was that? It was a, a, a B seventeen uh, outfit, the ninety uh, seventh bomb group. Okay. Had uh, headquarters there. Not headquarters, but had. It, uh, they had their planes, and we had a 
a runway, which was not concrete, it was metal put together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and on the other side of the metal, if you continue, the RAF was there. So they'd fly at night and we'd fly at daytime. So we'd keep them up at, at night and they'd keep us up at daytime. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we used to go there because the English had every single airplane they owned on one base. As you know, the Americans, if you're a, a, a base with B-17s, that's all you're going to have, mm -hmm. one airplane. And, uh, and we used to go there to look at their airplanes. And, and one day, a, one of the English guys stops us and says, uh, uh, could you get uh, any kind of juice, either orange juice or some kind of uh, juice like that? He says, we don't, we don't have that. We've got a lot of liquor. <laughs> he says, in fact, if you could get us some, some, some juice, uh, we'll give you some liquor. Sounds like a good trade to me. I don't know about you guys. But. Oh, it was a good trade. <laughs> Very good trade. And that's, that's when I got my first bottle of, uh, of gin, which I didn't use. I gave it to my crew. Let them get <laughs> but they didn't do it. Well, I know that you know this, but you know I, I've always heard that you know being on a B-17 crew was probably the most dangerous job out of the whole war. You had a very small rate of coming back or surviving that kind of thing. Oh well, yeah, the first uh, first guys over in the early part of the war only if they could last 25 missions. Absolutely. Yeah. Then they got to come home. Yeah, 25 very, was very the... few last 25 missions. Most were shot out. So, I mean, that had to have been something you thought about. Pardon me? That had to have been something that was going through your mind while you were being a pilot. Well, I think you were kind of lucky because in the first part of the war, none of the fighter planes could escort you in and out of Germany, Austria area. None of them had the range. It wasn't until the P-51 came along that you could actually get escorted in and out. And that's where the Red Tails came along because that's they were flying right. P-51s, which was the fighter plane at the time. Actually, the P-47 was better, but nobody, oh, yes. nobody mentions that. <laughs> well, I interviewed a P-47 pilot once and he said, oh yeah. If you yeah. want to live, you, you fly the P-47. If you want to look flashy, you, you, you fly the, the Mustang. You know, they, they use the uh, P-47 more for a ground attack type mm -hmm. thing, going after trains, things in that category. But when they put the P-51 against the P-47, P-47 won. Absolutely. So it was a better. That was plane. a monster plane. The jug, yeah, it was a monster plane. It had a massive engine in it, a lot of power. So, so you always had some kind of fighter escort, is that correct? Pretty much. And it was usually it the... Was, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, P-47s. It was the Tuskegee guys. The P-51s. Well, tell P -51s. me about those guys. About those guys? Yeah. For the average viewer that doesn't realize who the Tuskegee Airmen were, Talk about them a little bit. Well, unfortunately, they never got the credit they deserved. And uh, when the war, uh, the war was over as far as the Germans were concerned, and, and uh, 
one of the things they did with me is they had me uh, well they, they they put us all in the field uh, we were in tents and there was a a road that went right by the tents and there was uh, telephone poles with the uh, wires up above and one day one guy flew down the road and his wing hits one of the poles and the wire comes running down and he had a one guy sitting on the cabin of the plane and uh, the wire comes down, grabs this guy by the neck, and kills him. And uh, I said, "Wow, this this uh, this pilot's going to really get caught martial or something. He lost a man, and so on." And. Uh, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Uh, the, uh, the higher ups decided that uh, nobody is allowed to sit on top of a, a truck or an airplane uh, and uh, so there was no court martial because oh. they blamed the guy sitting up there not not the pilot well they were kind of desperate for pilots at the time so it's tough to wash somebody out I guess let me ask you a question. Did you keep your entire crew for all 31 missions? Yes. The same crew? You did. You never lost a crew member? Uh, no. Ne never lost a crew member. That's fantastic. Uh, some were, one or two were, were injured, but, but no, not no to the extent of being <coughs> killed or anything. Mm -hmm. What was the name of your airplane? <laughs> First of all, we didn't have enough planes that everybody in the in the squadron could have their own plane. Oh, so whenever you flew, y you were given a different plane. Mm. Like uh, the one I flew was called "Quit Your Bitchin'." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there were others. You know, of course, every time I flew, it was another plane. And uh, the uh, I forget what you'd call them. So not talking about crew chief, are you? So not a crew chief, but but the office. Uh, who uh, decides uh, who's flying the next day and stuff like that. The operations officer? Right. And uh, he uh, would fly occasionally, not often, and uh, He decided, <coughs> so we went to him, <coughs> a group of us, asking 
uh, telling them we'd love to have our own airplane. And he, his answer was, we don't have enough. Uh, but uh, when I'm flying, uh, I'll assign you to an airplane and we'll alternate, he and I. So when he flew, I flew a different airplane, provided we're both flying. <clears throat> and uh, and what, what exactly did that mean? Like if he was flying and you were flying a different airplane, does that mean he was flying the one that your the quit your bitching was that the, was he flying that one and Could you were be. flying something else or yeah. we alternated airplanes. Okay, that's what amounts to. Uh, but you had the same two airplanes then. Instead of having to fly everything, you could only fly the two. Uh, well, it's a whole bomb group is going up, so it's not just the uh, two of us. How many how many aircraft did you would, average in put, each formation? We put together in a format in a in a formation uh, three six So we're in a neighborhood of about 36 airplanes. Okay, in a normal formation? Yeah. Okay. That's a lot of bombs on target. Now, it's kind of interesting, the latest information on the Norton bomb site yes. was not that good. It was, you know, back then it was said, boy, this is the newest and greatest thing Known to oh yeah, that's here. what they convinced me. <laughs> but in reality, from what I've read, it really wasn't that accurate a bomb site. What did uh, what did your bombardier say? I never really uh, asked him uh, what he thought of it, uh, and the game was. He's a bombardier, mm -hmm. but he has nothing to do with the bomb site because uh, what they did were in his formation, and as soon as a bomb is dropped by the lead plane, the bombardier sees this mm -hmm. and just throws a switch and the bomb bay's open and mm -hmm. the bombs go. So, and uh, as I said, we were pretty uh, lucky as far as not losing anybody. <clears throat> and you credit all Although that. A lot of guys were, were lost. Yeah, but I mean, you credit not losing a lot of folks to the Red Tails, correct? Pardon me? You credit a lot of not losing anybody to the Tuskegee Airmen, correct? Yes. Oh, uh, credit to them? Yeah. Oh, yes. And, uh, one of the things that occurred when When the war ended, as far as the Germans were concerned, it ended, I think, in May of... May is correct. And uh, and they sent me 
to pick them up, the Tuskegee guys. Not all of them, as much as uh, not to fill the plane. And the reason being, they were going to move them back into a base which was now a, a regular uh, uh, bomb group base. Of course, all the bomb groups were down uh, down near the uh, Mediterranean, and uh, these guys were all the way up north. So uh, I went there, and uh, they weren't ready. So I took a walk, and I'm on this main drag. It's about two, three blocks long, and uh, I'm with. <laughs> I'm with this co-pilot I got, who wasn't really my my own co-pilot, and up comes a young girl. Who are you? What are you? And uh, perfect English. And I said, uh, "Oh, uh, Americano, uh, pilota." And and she looks at me and says, "You know Americano," and she, she points behind her, and there's a whole bunch of Tuskegee Air guys fooling around, uh, enjoying themselves, and uh, she says, "That's American." <laughs> Well, that's but anyway, I so, took yeah. I took the, uh, a plane load back, and uh, flying back, I had the co-pilot get out of the seat, and one by one, I let these guys fly the airplane, and. Uh, I told them what they could basically do, and uh, finally we got back to their base, their new base. And I landed the airplane, and up comes a, a guy, he says, uh, I'm the CEO of the Tuskegee guys. He says, uh, if you, we appreciate very much that you let these guys fly the airplane and, uh, and uh, I loved it, him. And uh, he says, if you uh, if you want and come back tomorrow, I'll check you out on the P fifty one. And uh, I said, "How could you do that? That's a it's a single engine, uh, one man pilot." He says. That's no problem, he says, we have uh, one plane where we removed all the equipment behind the pilot. And, uh, and what I'll do is, you'll stand behind the pilot and I will uh, I'll tell you, I'll be behind you, and I'll tell you what to do. It, it didn't, uh, <laughs> it didn't faze me because I said to myself, "He's, 
I'm going to be in a plane that I never flew before. I know nothing about its performance. I know nothing about any of the settings and so on. And he's going to stand behind me and say, uh, do this and do that, and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be telling you what to do. So uh, we never did it. <laughs> oh, oh, no! <laughs> Oh, now, I don't understand that because in World War II, most of those guys said if it's got a stick and a throttle, it's just an airplane, get in and fly it. <laughs> because a single seater, single engine is a lot easier to fly, you know, than a B 17. Yeah, but I mean, it sounds like you guys had a really good relationship with these guys oh with the uh, Tuskegee guys yeah yeah and that's something I mean back in those days that's something that was shall we say a little different in society back then well they deserved uh, all the credit they were should have gotten uh, yeah. I remember when they first told us about there's uh, going to be a new group of black pilots and uh, I don't even remember if it was looked upon as a good thing or a bad thing by present pilots. but. Uh, they, they were great, so... Let me ask you a question. I've, I've got just a little bit of time in a multi-engine aircraft, uh, mainly DC-3. Uh, did you have to do a lot of jockeying of the engines on landing to make sure that the aircraft was lined up properly on the runway? Well, you you got to do that. Yeah, you got to be lined up properly. But I mean, did you have to jockey the engines very much? No. You didn't. Okay. No. So once you got them set, then you could keep them pretty much in the same RPM range. Yeah, right. Pretty much the same range. Okay. And. Uh, The 17, uh, I found it uh, an easy airplane to fly, mm -hmm. responsive. It was Did you ever easy. do an aileron roll you, in it? Huh? Did you ever do an aileron roll in it? An aileron roll? Did you ever do that in a B-17? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <coughs> I want to go back to the, the beginning back when you were a cadet and you're standing in that meeting and he's offering you, you know, fly anything you want. What made you choose the B-17? I always uh, liked the idea of a uh, B-17. It was, to me, it was a popular airplane. Uh, there were a lot of movies about it. And uh, I read a lot about it and knew it was... So even the 40s they had movies about the B-17 already? What? Even in the 40s they already had movies out about the B-17? In the 40s? I'm not, I don't recall. Okay. I just wonder what, you know. In the 40s. What made you pick that plane? I always, uh, it 
It was a popular airplane in the respect that they made movies about it and stuff like that. So you uh, you knew the airplane. Oh yeah. So you enjoyed the Memphis Bell when it came out? Did you see the movie Memphis Bell? Sure. <laughs> Did that bring back some memories? The Memphis Bell. Uh, The pilot is from Asheville. Yeah, Colonel Morgan. Morgan. Oh, remember the story you told me about? Um, oh, yeah, you got a story. The uh, the guy who never made a mistake. Remember that story? He was a co-pilot or something like that, and. You didn't trust him because he never made a mistake, or or something. Do you remember? Do you remember what I'm talking about? Pretty much. I can't place uh, the guy we're talking about, but uh, I know uh, when I was an instructor. Yeah, that's right. So. Uh, I had three guys, and one of them, uh, I just, uh, I, I didn't feel right about him. In other words, in, in rating him, one of the things you had to do, not just him, I had these three other students, and you got to, uh, rate them uh, as to their ability and also uh, the last part of the rating was uh, would you want this man to be a wingman and a wingman is you know uh, He's there to protect you. And I felt this this guy, I'm not, I don't know what he's going to do. Uh, when he need, needs to do something like that, is he just going to disappear? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, But that's you, you what had, they did. You told me something to the effect that, um, you know, that, that he, he either he, he never made a mistake or something uh, didn't never went wrong, so you didn't know how he'd react in an emergency. You, I think that's what you told me. Pretty much. And so it, it was like um, you weren't sure what would happen because something always goes wrong. What would he do? Well, you're always ready for uh, anything to go. You need to get up. See that book? What, this? No, not that. Not this this one? one? Yes. Jackson, what was the, what were your takeoff and landing speeds in the B-17? Uh, the, the takeoff speed was somewhere uh, getting 
guessing around 90 miles an hour? I think it was less than that. No, less than that. Yeah. And so landing speed was probably 75 to 80. Right. All right, well, why don't we...